Hello, Eric back again, your learning futurist. Well, I've noticed that there is an inverse relationship between how cool you feel and how cool you look to others when you're inside virtual reality. I found this especially true for myself, <laughs> right? You're in your own little world, you're immersed. And also when we kind of get in these environments, we're represented by avatars. And what we see and what we're represented are more abstract than doing a camera type zoom situation. So a lot of people have the expectation or the, the feeling that using virtual reality is a little more private than other forms of communication. Well, today I'm going to be showing us how that's not the case. I'm going to be breaking down uh, a pretty good study on the fact that we can identify people and the technology behind it and explain just why you're not as private as you might think when you use virtual reality. Okay, so let's go back to this idea of what we think about as far as the expectations when we're in VR. Because when we're in VR, we don't see ourselves. Other people see us, but we don't see ourselves. We're immersed in this world and we're usually represented by some sort of avatar, some stylized version. A lot of people that use VR don't even use typical kind of these normalized versions of humans. They're in their uh, inhabiting animals and characters and shapes and other other things and beings and people and, and stuff like that. So they're, they feel a little bit more um, private. And my students have noticed this and commented on it several times in a lot of my own classes is that they feel more secure, they feel more confident speaking up and interacting with people online in these virtual environments when they're represented by an avatar much more than they are trying to do this on a Zoom meeting, for example, when they have to be in front of a camera like I am now. So the expectation, the feeling of privacy is there, but it's not really. And what I'm going to be referring to a little bit uh, in this video is a study that came out of Stanford and um, published in Nature, a very reputable uh, academic journal. And I'm gonna be referring back to this kind of study from time to time. And the basic of this study is that um, they found that they could identify anonymous users of VR to a high degree, over 95%, uh, just using the data extracted from interacting with 360 degree video and body movement that's being tracked to, to actually in, to um, use virtual reality. So just using the data that's collected through normal interaction with VR, you're able to identify who is using it. So how is that possible? How are we able to kind of identify even anonymous users inside of VR when we think that we're private, right? This is so one of the first things you might want to understand about using virtual reality and the data that it's being collected about you is that there's different types of virtual reality and the way that it uses you to get you immersed into that world because it needs to track you. It needs to track your movement, mostly your head movement because when you move your eyes or move your head, that is going to be shifting your view that's being displayed to you in front of your face. So you move your head right, you're gonna see things to your right. So you need to be tracked in order for this to work actually. So. There's two different main kind of versions of this. And one is three DOF and six DOF, three degrees of freedom and six degrees of freedom. And uh, the study that we're sharing today is doing the six degrees of freedom, but they both take in this head tracking movement around you. So three degrees of freedom just moves, just tracks your head, your stationary, right? The pitch, jaw and roll of your head and so you can display that uh, imagery as you move your head correctly to your eyes. Now we're gonna add three more degrees of freedom because now we're, we have to be tracked either from the inside out or the outside in to track the relative position of your headset to the surroundings. So how, how far is your uh, head off the ground and if do you move forward or backwards or left or right 
and you get to move that that gets translated into the in a virtual uh, environment that you're in right so this is already you can see taking in an enormous amount of data about you right where your body is where your head is moving how far it is off the ground and how relative to what you're looking at on the screen what your head does in relative motion another step to understand about this is the head movement right you're going to be moving left and right up and down pitch and roll and so this also starts to get into the where what you're looking at and there's a lot of um, mental conditions a lot of physiological conditions that are related to how we move our heads this is also getting into the idea of nonverbal communication uh, the way we move our heads when we're listening or talking to people sends a lot of signals of communication to the listener that we aren't even aware of and maybe even the listener is not aware of, but it is communicating something and we're starting to kind of connect these uh, data points with machine learning and pull out some of these things from people which we'll get into a little bit later in this video another important uh, aspect to know about this is the things that are being tracked right so if i want to pull out my headset here right this headset is tracking the th six degrees of which where my head moves forward back left right yaw pitch roll of my head but it's also tracking my hands through these hand tracking devices that most headsets have these days so it's also tracking those same things for my hands so how i rest my hands how i move my hands is also being tracked uh, usually at high fidelity right uh, uh, several 60 to 100 times per second the, the all these data points so right so now we have the position relative to your body we can auto we can already see that we can take measurements of your body when we're at a seeing that we're at a resting position so we can get start to get understand like the physicality of the person using it right so six off three off the dimensions and positions and how you're tracked in VR and the position of your body parts are all things that are going to into uh, tracking you in VR and they're very important to the study that I'm showing you today as well all right now the study did a bunch of different ways to use machine learning and put some algorithms against this tracking data and see if they could predict the next movement or and also see if they could predict accurately the correct user uh, using the VR. And so they used a couple of different methods and the most accurate one was using something called random forest and it got 95.3% accuracy with just using five minutes of tracking, head tracking, body tracking data. And this is people that came in uh, to a museum to use a, um, to participate in the study and watch 360 degree video and do some kind of surveys inside of VR. So what were they tracking? So you can see all the data points that were tracked in this. And so the, the degree of which um, each one is tracked, all were kind of relative, but one sticks out in particular, and that is the headset Y position. Now, you can already kind of tell where this is going. So the Y position is the position relative to the floor. So the headset and how, it, what the distance it is relative to the floor where you're standing on. So the headset knows how far um, above the floor it is, so it can know already your height, but not just your height, it knows how much you sag your head or how often you move your head up and down. And this seems to be the biggest um, identifying factor by far uh, in kind of identifying the users that go in and use these VR um, environments. And this goes back to the three versus uh, six degrees of freedom. And this might be a kind of argument or a plus for using three degrees of freedom maybe in educational environments because we cannot collect that distance off the floor because we're not tracking the environment 
to know our rel relative position in it. And so, although this might not be as immersive, you might have a little more cyber sickness or motion sickness because the motion of your body doesn't match the motion inside the environment, but you're not able to identify users as well. The study said, I think the accuracy went from 95% down to somewhere between 20 and 40% without that special Y position in tracking your head movements. Right. So why am I talking about this? Why is this important? Well, we can identify users in it. And this thing that I showed earlier, this is the quest put out by uh, Facebook, Oculus, owned by Facebook, and they started requiring um, you to log into Facebook to use this device. So now they're collecting that fingerprint of you that identifies you and at connecting it to your Facebook. So maybe in the future, without even having to log into Facebook, uh, buying some of this data from perhaps a VR game company or some enterprise tool using VR can now identify you with a Facebook account. That's very alarming and also very concerning for the number of people, also many reaching out to me uh, trying to figure out what, how to best to use a lot of these quests that were bought for educational purposes before this kind of login requirement went into effect. But to, to end off this video, I'd like to go into a little bit of an hypothetical. Now, uh, what I'm about to say now is um, probably open to a lot of interpretation and debate, but I would like to try to paint a picture of how this might play out uh, in the future if left uncurbed in either commercial, social, or these kind of, the way the, the, the VR landscape and data collection is being monetized today. All right, let's say that someone uh, buys a VR headset and they start playing some VR games. And they like this one game, they get it, and they see that it's free and they want to try it out and they play it for 20 minutes and something like a hundred and something million data points is collected about that person and how they use VR and a fingerprint is made about that person. Now, little known to the person using that, that game uh, in the terms of service that you kind of never read and click and go on, go into these services, uh, stated that the the data that's collected about you can be used for other purposes and perhaps research or data collection or ads, which Facebook has already said is in the uh, privacy and uh, terms of service for the Oculus uh, Quest that I mentioned earlier. So data is collected about this person. They just used VR in that game for 20 minutes. And then that company that created that game decides to sell off some of their user data to various people. One of the customers for this data is an insurance company, a health insurance company. And they match that tracking data up with a lot of other tracking data that they've collected and done studies with, perhaps internally or externally, with conditions found in people to kind of match you up to the likelihood of you having some sort of a physiological or mental disorder or the likely to have one in the future. Like for example, your, your head movement and how well you dip your head during certain situations is, may, could be very relative to you getting dementia in old age. And so the insurance company bought this data and now it's going to deny not just you, but maybe your sister that applies to insurance maybe in the future because this particular issue is not uh, is hereditary. It's, uh, it's very tightly linked to your heritage. So now we have the situation where somebody that didn't even use VR is being affected by the data collection that happened in VR and being used for the purposes of predicting and analyzing people's uh, livelihood and behavior. All right, so what do you think? Uh, do you, after watching this video, do you feel more compelled or more secure in VR or less? I'm probably a little bit less. <laughs> I don't mean to be alarming with these videos, but I do want to get out this information. It's one of the core uh, missions of making these videos for public consumption. All right, if you have any questions or concerns or your thoughts about this, I'd love to hear about it in the comments below. But for now, I'll leave it there. 
We'll see you in the next one, guys. Bye-bye.